This uh, we conference are hired will to, now be recorded. We were hired to see if the methodology used on the East Coast for growing seaweed could be implemented in Alaska. And I've been doing that ever since. I designed, built, and operated the first two commercial seaweed uh, hatcheries in the state, first in Juneau, then in Kodiak. And I've just built out a third commercial hatchery for the university as well. So tonight's talk is titled Kelp I Need Some Algae, Kelp Hatchery Innovation. This is about my thesis work. I'm currently pursuing my master's, getting a master's in fisheries through University of Alaska Fairbanks here in Juneau under Dr. Steckel. Um, and this project I designed to really try and have immediate benefits or immediate implications for the industry that could be applied as soon as I got the results and disseminate that information to farmers and operators across the state and hopefully the country, if not the world. So let's take a step back and figure out what the heck is an algae versus a seaweed versus a kelp. Oftentimes I'll throw around kelp and seaweed. Sometimes I'll refer to a seaweed as a plant because it sounds better than saying it is an algae. That just doesn't feel right to say. An algae is any non-vascular, non-flowering, photosynthetic, aquatic, or marine organism. Kind of a big umbrella for that one. So it could be as big as those giant kelp plants you get down in Monterey, or as small as like this plankton you see on the, uh, the right side of the pond scum that turns your fish pond green. For the big stuff, the macroalgae, the seaweed, is the kind of the stuff that you and I can see with our naked eye and they divided into three major groups thankfully they're pretty easy to tell apart we have the greens which are predominantly green the reds which are predominantly big and red and our kelps are the big brown stuff so like the bull kelp you see in this photo to give a little bit of kelp morphology or what the heck a seaweed looks like and what the things are called this is a, a laria or a ribbon kelp it's pretty common across all throughout coastal alaska the main part of it is the blade. You can kind of think of that like the leaf of the seaweed. It's where most of the photosynthesis is occurring. Um, so very much like the leaf you get in a terrestrial plant or flower. Some of the seaweeds or kelps will have what's called a midrib. This is kind of a thicker leathery section that runs down the middle of that blade. Again, not all kelps have that, but this ribbon kelp does, hence its name ribbon kelp. Some of these kelps will have a stipe. You can kind of think of those as like the stem. They're usually pretty tough, pretty leathery, leathery, kind of designed or meant to keep the seaweed off the bottom of the seafloor and kind of more upright. They'll all have a hold fast. It looks like a root system, but really it's an anchor. So that's what's securing that kelp or seaweed down to the rocks or the substrate, whatever it's growing on. Think about how tough that must be to hold a bull kelp plant or kelp uh, on the high surf zones. They have incredible adhesion to the rock surfaces. And some kelps will produce sporophylls. They kind of look like clusters of grapes at the bottom of the, of the whole structure. Those are only produced in the later part of its life cycle. That's where it becomes fertile or reproductive. Seaweeds have been harvested and utilized in Southeast Alaska since time immemorial, especially by the um, indigenous peoples who've been here. Um, pyropia, one of the species, uh, or genus, is uh, what the locals call the blackweed. There's two different types they harvest during the seasons that they're around. It's also the same genus as the sushi seaweed. Palmaria, also known as dulse, has been wild harvested and also sold in small commercial batches. And of course, bull kelp has been widely utilized, as well as fucus or the rockweed. It's very common as well to find in the intertidal zone throughout coastal Alaska. Currently, there are three main species being grown throughout Alaska. The Alaria or ribbon kelp on the left, that's kind of the one I was showing you the different morphology structures on. In the middle, we have Stephanie Mangini ho holding up a beautiful piece of sugar kelp or saccharina. And then on the right, we have our bull kelp or our Neria cystis. And the reason these are the species that are being targeted is predominantly because the Alaria and the Saccharina were already being grown on the East Coast. So a lot of the methodology and marketing and target for those species is already being developed and utilized. So we kind of copied that on the Alaskan industry. Bull kelp is gaining a lot of momentum, especially uh, for certain uses as food. It's getting a lot of press. Folks like Barnacle are doing really cool stuff with it. So more and more farmers are beginning to grow bull kelp throughout the state as well. 
that doesn't mean that's all of the species that we could grow. There's a number that are potentially a really cool product that we could be uh, utilizing. There's the dragon kelp, the Eularia on the left. Um, the cool thing about dragon kelp, it's kind of unique to our part of the world. So it'd be really fun to utilize that. And it also gets absolutely massive if you've ever seen it in the wild. So that could be a fantastic source of biomass or a really fun product for people to play around with. In the middle, we have the um, sargassum. In Okinawa, they pickle it, it's called hijiki. So we could have, we have a endemic species that's very similar to that that could potentially be a viable foods uh, product as well. We have the sea lettuces, the ulva and the ovarium. Now those two are very hard to tell apart as a layman because there's literally a cell's difference. One is one cell thick and one is two cells thick. These are already in tumble culture being produced commercially down in Mexico. And we have a lot of different laminarias as well. So laminaria is kind of like a family or group of these really thick leathery kelps. Those could be very analogous to the Japanese kombu, which has a very, very uh, high part in the Japanese as well as Korean cuisine as the basis for their soup stocks. So I encourage everyone, if you're curious about what we have in the area, or if you don't know what a seaweed is, the best resource is seaweedsofalaska.com. They also have a print book that's very water resistant and weather resistant. So I recommend getting a copy of that, throwing that in your rucksack next time you're gonna go out on the boat or go splash around the intertidal zone. Or if you have cell service, seaweedsofalaska.com is your best resource. And on the left, you can see at the top there, the chlorophyta, orchophyta, and rhodophyta. That's your green, your browns, and your reds. Kind of a good basis of where to look for what species it is, is go off the color. So why do we want to grow seaweed or even harvest it? Well, we all know about seaweed as a food source. Again, Native Alaskans have been harvesting it since time immemorial. It's very common in Asian cuisine. You know, you get your sushi, you think about your seaweed roll on the outside of those seaweed snacks. Recently, we've been seeing this very wonderful boom in more Western style or new ways of incorporating seaweed into diet, so like barnacles, kelp pickles, and kelp hot sauces, their chili crisp. But you can also find algal derivative, derivatives pardon me, in some pretty unique places. Uh, alginate, which is kind of a product that seaweed, and especially kelps produce, make things super smooth and creamy, kind of frothy or foamy. Oftentimes you'll find it added to ice cream, sometimes even toothpaste or beer. And animal feed is a surprising use for seaweed as well. There was a publication that came out in the last 10 years of a project done in Australia with a tropical seaweed, and they substituted it to a certain percentage in a cow's diet, and it reduced methane production by almost 40% on those cows. So that has some pretty massive implications for global climate change, as well as making dairy and beef cattle a little bit more sustainable as a industry. And it used to be kind of the, the trade secret of, oh, we put seaweed in all of our fancy cosmetics. But now these cosmetic industries are really lauding and talking about how much algae they have in their products. This was just a quick search on Sephora for seaweed. I just typed in seaweed and these are some of the products. We have a hair blowout spray, we have a facial mask, we have lotions. So people are really, really, um, happy and proud of the seaweed now that they have in their cosmetic and pharmaceutical products. And another really cool potential use for seaweed is biofuel. The technology has been around for a number of decades, over 50 years, to turn seaweed into biofuel like you would with corn or sugar. The challenge has been the price point. Now, when it used to be that you could go out and wild harvest metric tons of this stuff, yeah, that would pencil out to produce cheap enough gas to be competitive. But once we realized how ecologically important seaweeds are, especially the big kelps, they kind of put a, a cut and stop to all of that wild harvest. Now we're trying to figure out how to grow it on that scale so we can actually produce sustainable, responsibly grown seaweed for biofuel instead. So how does that commercial growing of seaweeds actually work? This is a photo of me when I was running the Blue Evolution Hatchery in Kodiak. And you can see all of those aquariums are full of pipes and they're all growing baby kelp. So how does that even work? Well, the whole thing's really tightly tied to the natural life cycle of a seaweed or a kelp. So here's an imaginary kelp. It's got both a sporophyll, that kind of grape cluster on the right, as well as a saurus. Now, 
A real kelp won't have both. They'll either have one or the other. But at some time in their life cycle, generally mid to late summer, they become reproductive. These fertile bodies become apparent. They're very visual to tell uh, whether or not they're fertile or not. And those actually release spores that swim around. They're motile. And they're going to swim around for a couple hours, maybe a day or two, depending on how much juice they have, how healthy they were, what the oceanic conditions are. But eventually they're going to stop, settle, and adhere and germinate. And they're going to adhere to everything and anything they come in contact with. They're going to settle and germinate on the bottom of your dock, bottom of your boat, the bottom of that rock, on that barnacle shell, wherever they think is going to be the best plight. And they can be a little choosy, but again, they're kind of at the whim of the ocean. But they'll germinate into these male and female gametophytes. And these are only like five or six cells big. So you're never going to see them with your naked eye if you're wandering the intertidal zone. Eventually, those get fertile. And the male gametophyte actually releases a swimming sperm that has to go find a female gametophyte somehow in the ocean and fertilize her. And she's going to produce a little egg, a little oocyte that slowly grows into a teeny tiny little kelpling, we call them kelp babies. And those grow pretty dang rapidly into those juveniles and finally into that big adult sporophyte, that big plant we want to harvest and grow. So the hatchery stage really is focused on this section from when we're releasing our spores to we have these recruits that are a couple millimeters long that go back into the ocean. You can kind of think of it more like a nursery. If you're a gardener, you have your starters that you have inside your house. They're in beautiful, perfect conditions. They've got the right amount of light, the right amount of fertilizer, the right temperature before you put them out to the wilds of your hoop house or wilds of your raised bed. We do the same thing with our kelp. So the first stage is to go out in the late summer, fall, even now, and find your fertile plants. That could involve snorkeling for some of the subtitle species. This is a picture of me holding up a, picture, a piece of sugar kelp. And you can kind of see that dark patch in the middle there. That's the sori. It looks like someone has just taken Nutella and smeared it all over. That's what's producing all of those spores. So I'm going to collect a whole bunch of plants that are having those, those sorites already developed. And I'm going to take them back to the lab. And I'm going to stress them out to get them to release their spores. And you can see how milky and cloudy that water looks in that beaker. I'm basically convincing these kelp that it's their last chance to be reproductive. You better release all your spores right now if you want your genes to go on to the future. And when they release spores, they release spores. This is a video of bull kelp release spores. This is probably over 100 million spores per milliliter of water. This is an absolutely significant, wild amount of spores. And if you watch it again, you can see some of them kind of start corkscrewing and spiraling down. That's them testing out to see if it's a good spot to grow. So again, they'll swim around for 12 to 24 hours. We let them um, settle for about a 24 hour period before we do anything else with them. And we want them to settle on string. We have string or almost like kite twine wrapped around pieces of vinyl or PVC piping. And again, those spores are gonna stick to everything in that aquarium, the inside of the pipe, the inside of the tank. But what we really care about is when they settle and grow on that string. And we're gonna hold them in these incubators we're going to incubate these pipes by just like your starters for your garden we're going to maintain temperature we're going to have a light schedule we're going to have certain light intensity as well as light color because if you're familiar with gardening certain plants like different colors or different temperatures of light kelp's kind of easy they just like full spectrum just blast them they're fine if you have the ability to kind of start them with lower light and slowly graduate them up they seem to like that better but these are intertidal plants they're pretty dang hardy but their optimal growth uh, zone is about 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, so mid to low 50s Fahrenheit. And they're like 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. And over about an eight-week period, they're going to go from naked pipes to these little fuzzy gametophytes. And you can see that top picture, those little exclamation points. Those are the teeny tiny little kelp blades, the kelp babies. Aren't they precious? And eventually you're going to get these kind of fuzzy looking pipes for the little blades, those little kelp babies are about two to four millimeters in length. And again, that only takes two months and then they're ready to go back into the ocean. 
We call it outplanting when we send them to the farm to be outplanted. You can see I'm holding one of those pipes that's covered in kelp and I've threaded a rope through it. Now on these kelp farms, those lines are gonna be our grow lines, which are kind of more often called long lines. We're gonna secure one end of that twine to the end of the rope and then on the boat, go down the length of the rope, unwinding that twine around that rope. So as the kelp grows, it's gonna grow off the twine and onto that long line or that grow line to give it a bigger surface area that can support its weight. And kelp farms in general can be any sort of dimension, any sort of materials. We've had farmers utilize um, buoys from beach cleanups, they utilize crab pots as anchors, wagon wheel, or sorry, train wheels as anchors. You can use any sort of material you want. The biggest thing is that the lines need to stay at least six feet underwater. Any closer to the surface and the kelp doesn't do as well. It just kind of gets beaten up. Freshwater lensing, uh, potentially waves, or if a, you know some drift kelp comes by or some branches come by after a big rain, it could be scraping on the ropes. And that we need to have the lines be able to disconnect from the frame or kind of the outer edges of that farm so we can thread the rope through the pipe. Other than that, it can be any dimension you want. You can have a long and skinny farm. You can have a nice square one. We really work with the farmers to see what kind of scaling they want and how long those individual long lines are as hatchery operators to determine kind of what size we're giving them in terms of footage on those pipes. So you outplant your kelp anywhere from like late November through early February. And they're going out again as teeny tiny little millimeter long things. Within a month or two, you start seeing kelp. It's kind of nerve wracking until you can actually see them with your naked eye, but suddenly you have inch long baby blades. Come back a month later, you've got a foot. Come back three months later and you might have these big, beautiful six foot long plants. We've got, again, Stephanie Mangini on the left and a very unenthusiastic, but still happy Dr. Steckel on the right. I swear that's his happy face. And those are both sugar kelp that we're holding up there. You can see with Dr. Steckel, he's holding up that long line. It's over his head and the tail end or the tips of that kelp is still on the ground. And then it's harvest time. Harvest happens usually anywhere from mid-April through the end of summer, depending on your species. Um, we've seen that ribbon kelp likes to be harvested earlier or kind of starts to degrade faster than some of the other species. So there's a potential for farmers to actually stagger out which species they're outplanting when so they can have a longer harvest or they can combine them all and have a single big harvest. There's a lot to play around with as we learn more about how each different species likes to behave. And the mariculture industry in Alaska is growing very rapidly. It's already projected to be a hundred million dollar industry within the next 15 years. We've seen incredible growth since it really kicked off back in 2016. This is Nick Mangini hauling in that first ever commercial kelp harvest in Kodiak in 2016. You can see uh, how high tech that was when it was just um, basically driving down the line, hand over handing, and me in the orange jacket with a Vicky knife just cutting off kelp into fish totes. But all the cultivation protocols and open source manuals, so free manuals I can find on the internet, are based for either East Coast industry or Asian markets and Asian industry. And as anyone who's been to the East Coast or Asia knows that Alaska is pretty dang different. So we need to adapt some of these manuals and protocols for Alaska's environmental conditions, our state regulations through fish and game, as well as logistical challenges. Predominantly, shipping. So one of the focuses for my project I really wanted to look at was the hatchery production. One of the big hurdles is the expense of materials, especially the fertilizers or nutrients we're adding. That can add up pretty quickly in the hatchery stage. Another big challenge for farmers is the fact that the string that we're outplanting so that we're unwinding from those pipes around that rope, it's all synthetic, which is great. It means it lasts the whole season. The kelp has months to step off the twine onto the long line and then be harvested. But that means at the end of every season, that line has to be, that string has to be cut and removed from those ropes. You don't want to run a Vicky knife down the entire length of your rope. That would destroy it. So you have to sit there and by hand, relatively delicately, pull off that string. And think about it, if you're growing 40,000 feet of kelp, that's 40,000 feet of string you have to remove every single year. 
not only is it pain in the butt for our farmers, but as they're harvesting, sometimes as they're pulling the kelp out of the water, that twine might become entangled or start pulling off the rope. It will actually kind of unzip or rip off the kelp. And so suddenly you're watching hundreds of pounds of your kelp sinking down into the ocean because your string got tangled. So the goal of my master's project was to continue the advancement of the industry by reducing production expense, plastic waste, as well as labor. So the hatchery innovation side, I really want to identify an inexpensive, readily available natural fiber that would biodegrade after adequate holdfast development. So don't melt too fast. You have to wait for the kelp to grow on top or onto the rope before it goes away. And I wanted to see if I could find an inexpensive pre-made, readily available uh, fertilizer solution that would perform as well or potentially better than the industry standards. I focus on growing sugar kelp, Saccharina latissima, because that was again, one of the industry standards for the state. They've been doing it a lot on the East Coast. So we had already a couple years of good data on how it was growing in Alaska, what the kind of yields were that we could use as a baseline. I also chose sugar kelp because it has very delicate holdfasts. Here I'm pointing to the twine or that seeded string that we wrapped around the rope. And you can really see how spindly that root system or that holdfast system is on the sugar kelp. As far as holdfasts go, it's kind of a wuss. Sugar kelp likes to grow in areas where there's a good amount of current, but no waves. So think about an area where you're getting like a narrow channel, a lot of water exchange but like a really muddy, almost silty bottom. You can get like a 10 foot sugar kelp plant growing on a piece of shell that's maybe the size of a silver dollar. But they will honestly, I've seen the sugar kelp break and fall off the rope under its own weight as it's being harvested. So I figured if the sugar kelp can succeed with this novel twine or this natural fiber, it should in theory work for all other kelps that have a more robust or more solid and firm holdfast system. <clears throat> so to grow the sugar kelp, the kind of industry standard, the like lab manual that everyone refers to is the New England Seaweed Culturing Handbook. It's not just for kelps, they also cover how to culture a couple different red seaweeds, but in their book, they focus on growing sugar kelp. And that's kind of the manual I was told to read when I first started in the industry back in 2015, it's kind of what everyone kind of refers to. It's got a really good compilation of a bunch of different scientific papers, manuals, and just expertise into one single open source, so free, document. And I had five replicates per treatment, so 12 treatments total. And this is to make sure that it wasn't just a one-off. I wanted to make sure that I had good, solid data at the end of the whole thing to show that, yes, it wasn't just a fluke that this one batch worked well. We have five different isolates that have the same treatment and in theory, the entire same conditions. So we wanted to get the average of all of those to see how it would play out over time. Because just with all sorts of natural life, you're gonna get variation no matter what you do. So just like before, as I mentioned, you get the spore solution. We put our PVC pipes wrapped with twine. Now I had that picture of me in the hatchery where my pipes were about um, a foot tall. Now I'm doing with PVC pipes that are maybe three inches tall because again I don't have to go big scale for my science. I was doing lots of little replicates, little tiny beakers, about three meters or nine feet of string instead of a couple hundred. Those would grow and then we take them just like of the commercial operations out to the farm and wind them around those long lines or grow lines. I had four long lines I built out that are about 90 feet in length each and then Fingers crossed it would all grow out and be big and beautiful. So for the industry standard, the fertilizers that we were really looking at was this one called Probosoles Enriched Seawater with Iodine or PESI. Now this is dialed in for kelps. They love the stuff. Works great, but it's really labor intensive to make in a lab. It has over 14 individual components making three different solutions. You can buy it, as you can see here, but it's $55 for a little flask basically. And you're using 10 milliliters per liter of tank, which doesn't sound that much, but if I have an 11 liter tank, so I think about the size of a shoe box, that's 110 milliliters every single week I'm adding to it. So that really adds up quickly. And then the other industry standard that a lot of commercial, a lot of commercial cup users are 
um, utilizing now is this F over two solution. It says algae food, algae, kelp, great, perfect. But the algae that it's designed to grow are like microalgaes, things you'd then feed to like shrimps or, or abalone or mollusks, some other filter feeders in a lab. <clears throat> it has the stuff that kelp needs, but it has a lot of stuff that kelp doesn't necessarily utilize, but things that I want, I don't want in my tank love. So things that would be really, really good and advantageous for diatoms, a contaminant that I constantly struggle with. They love this stuff. So there's a lot of extraneous materials, minerals, and vitamins in there that I don't need and could potentially uh, increase contamination risk. It also has a short shelf life. Some of the stabilizers they have in there to maintain those vitamin compounds, they're only good for about a year and a half. So if you order too much, you might just have to throw some out at the end of the season anyways. And here's what I selected as kind of the, let's try it and see if it works. It's Jack's Professional Water Soluble Fertilizer. 25515 refers to the nitrogen, potassium, and um, phosphorus ratio. And this was about as close as we could get to being with the, in parallel with the PESI or the PESI, Provisolis Enriched CO Water with Iodine. They had about the same ratio of the NPK as PESI. And it's cheap. And I first came across it reading some articles by Dr. Uh, Jose Zartucci down in Mexico, as well as Dr. Charlie Yerish, who wrote the New England uh, Culture Handbook. They were using it to grow green uh, sea lettuce, green green seaweeds in bubble cultures. And they said it was great because it had, again, had that same ratio of NPK and it was clean. I've tried a couple other fertilizers, especially if I was trying to go for organic and they became really filmy. There's kind of like this bio scuzz that would happen in the water, but the Jax dissolves really, really well, very cleanly. And it seemed to work well for them. So I thought maybe it'll work for seaweed and check it out. I can get it on Amazon a 25 pound bag for $71. We got one of those bags back in 2015. I've barely put a dent into it. It doesn't ship prime, but yeah, you can't win them all. So we had a number of different solutions we were doing, not just full strength, but we wanted to do some other variations as well. So we have the full strength jacks that would be equal molarity or equal concentration as to the Provisolis enriched seawater with iodine. Then we also did full strength jacks with iron added. Now the kelp requires iron to be become fertile when they're in those little gametophyte, those microscopic stages. Without iron, they'll just remain gametophytes forever. So they need that iron to become reproductive and then grow into those nice big plants that we want. We also did a half strength of jacks with iron as well as a half strength PESI because in some other experimentation I'd done previously, just kind of in the hatchery, the half strength seemed to work better than the full strength propasolis. And then again, as another control, we had that F over two or that algae food. You could also buy off Amazon. And we had five replicates again for each one of these treatments. For the string, the industry standards, we kind of had two we were bouncing back and forth between. These are both synthetics, they're both um, petroleum-based strings, nylons. The left is Cremona. It's a three-stranded twine, um, but this is what they predominantly use in Asia. It's very hard to get a hold of in North America, unless you know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. So talk about shipping um, headaches. But it's a great twine for seaweed. They love it. It's very durable. It's kind of got this nice rough texture to it too. So they have more surface area for those gametophytes to stick to. And it doesn't fray, which is awesome. You don't have to worry about like singeing off the ends or knotting it. it really, it's really hard for it to come undone and fray. And then the American standard, industry standard, is this hold fast tufting twine. I don't know how they decided this was something that they were going to use, but it works great. I've, it's very funny because tufting is the act of sewing buttons onto upholstery. So it's a marine tufting twine. So sewing buttons onto nice sailboat or yacht upholstery, I guess. And I just love that the name is hold fast, like the little anchor system for a kelp too. The nice thing about the hold fast string versus the Cremona is that it's a little bit thinner as well. So I can fit more on a certain pipe length than I can of the Cremona, which could also improve hatchery efficiency and cost reduction. Um, 
recently this holdfast has become very very difficult to find a lot of the distributors realized that us kelp nerds were um, really really into it i started jacking up the price i had to go some really deep google and amazon searching to find some i actually called an upholstery depot in oregon to see if they had it because i had it listed on their website and i couldn't order it and they were like yeah, you know, we, we, we have a really hard time finding it. I don't know what's happened to it. I'm not sure if the manufacturer stopped making it. And I had to tell them, no, actually, it's all of the kelp hatcheries are sucking up all of your button sewing twine. Sorry. But uh, if you have some, call me. So for the natural fibers that I wanted to look at, we really wanted to highlight things that were really, really easy to find. So we just went down to the local stores. We went to Ace Hardware to get some cotton twine. Uh, we got cotton cord. Not pictured here is sisal, which I was really excited about. Sisal is an agave-based fiber. Uh, those with cats are probably most familiar with it because that's the little twine that's wrapped around your cat scratching posts. I was kind of excited about the idea of having this marriage of the terrestrial agave plant with the marine seaweed industry and potentially the marketing of having you know a margarita with kelp in it uh, there was so much potential there um i also looked at hemp i had to find an unwaxed hemp i was worried that having wax on the top would potentially uh discourage or interfere with that settlement or that sticking of the gametophytes or spores that cotton cord again came from Ace Hardware. I also tried a wool. I thought that would be kind of cool too to tie in that you know terrestrial ecosystem with the marine industry. This was just tapestry weaving wool, and we tried a cotton braid like a macrame braid, very similar to like parachute cord, where you have the braided sheath on the outside with just cord on the inside. And we did those four long lines, um, two were for the fertilizer experiment and two were for the natural fiber experiment off of Coggin Island is part of the um, Channel Island State Park here in Juneau, which is great. It was through the park service. They're very enthusiastic, very excited and cooperative with us going out there constantly. We've been going and having kelp outplanted off Coggin off and on since 2015. And the wonderful thing about Coggin Island is it's close to town. Because I had to go out at least once a month, ideally every two weeks, weather permitting, to go out and measure the kelp. And I was going out there, you know, and sometimes leaving before it got fully light and or coming back in the dark because it took such a long time to measure it all. Um, any kelp farmers will know that you have to go out there pretty regularly to uh, check your farm after any big blow. If there's a big storm, you got to make sure that nothing's been drifting around. And we really wanted to have a field component and make sure that our stuff actually spent a full winter out in the ocean just like a real alaskan kelp farm so that our results would actually be viable for a real alaskan kelp farm and sequester farm which is now a kelp farm out of juno is almost line of sight from Coglin island so they're about four miles to the west of us so it's pretty cool to be like whatever we have here should most definitely work for you because it's almost the exact same orientation same aspect same conditions just like any sort of project or experiment, we did have a number of challenges you ran into. Um, one of the first ones you ran into was supply chains. I couldn't get enough of that beading silk. Um, oh, that was the other fiber, the beading silk for putting your nice pearls on. That was a Dr. Steckel recommendation. I actually had to have my, jet, my dad go to a Joann's in Seattle while he was down there to pick me up an extra couple yards of the stuff. Um, some things just wouldn't ship to Alaska. We tried looking into getting the raw materials for provisolis and rich seawater with iodine. If you're not affiliated with the university or have a hazmat security clearance, there are some you just cannot get. So that was a, another good lesson learned of that we have to find something that people can utilize without having that clearance. Our first spore release um, looked great. Look, we had done the little guys swimming around, put them in the incubator, checked on them two and a half weeks later and couldn't really see any gametophytes. So we had to go back out well, first we had to wait for a weather window, then go back out to collect more parent plants. Um, so that's Muriel and I underwater diving together to collect more seaweed. Once we did outplant our stuff, uh, we put those four long lines out over two days in early December of last year. It, we had beautiful flat calm weather the first day, uh, marginal weather the second time. Um, and then we had to go away for the holidays. And when we came back or over that period, there was an absolutely massive storm that came through, perfectly married with an extreme high tide. 
So it kind of drifted or picked up my farm and moved it around and tangled it around itself, which is what kind of that spaghetti monster on the right is. Thankfully, all the kelp actually stayed underwater. So I was able to gently untangle it and redeploy it and had was able to still get good data from it. These are some of the preliminary results from April. Um, I, it's interesting to see here, this is the fertilizer. And you can see that over the two lines, in theory, should be exact replicates of each other. And there is some variation between the two lines. But the trend, so the growth rate, is the same. Between all the different fertilizers, that kind of slope angle is very, very consistent, which basically reflects or uh, shows us that once they get out into the ocean, they all kind of grow the same rate. So it really highlights the necessity and importance of having a really good hatchery stage or getting those seed starters in really, really peak performance before they go out to the ocean. And here's some of the final data um, for our fertilizers. This is growth rate, so percentage per, um, of growth over per day over time. And we kind of averaged it all out. Um, surprisingly, Jax, the cheap Amazon fertilizer, outperformed everybody with nothing added to it. So that was really exciting for us to see that, hey, this novel fertilizer is comparable, if not outperforming, some of the other industry standards that we were seeing. So that was our clear and final winner, but everything else was relatively the same. Again, this is just growth rate. It was this shows that it was growing faster. Now in terms of final yield, this is uh, kilograms per meter. Uh, so sorry, it's metric, I'm a scientist. And you can see those black bars on top show how much deviation there was. So what the kind of range of uh, scale was or shifting away from that, that normal point in the middle. Uh, really fascinating that the F over two, which is kind of the industry standard now for commercial production, had the le the lowest amount of yield per meter out of all the different ones. And again, that our jacks outperformed or met the produce lowest and rich CO water with iodine. So really, really exciting here to show that, hey, maybe we're onto something. This this worked for us, at least Coggin Island last winter. For our fiber, this graph has lots of numbers on it. Um, this is again, average yield. So kilos per meter on the left, um, and then the different treatments on the bottom. The numbers on the top reflect whether or not the string was there. So zero means that, that by the end, there was no fiber left on the rope, that the twine or string had completely dissolved. If there are numbers that aren't zero, that's the break strength in kilograms of how, long, how much force it took for me to actually break the remainder string off the rope. Interesting kind of whole spread here, sisal. Ooh, did not do well. I was so hopeful for that agave fiber, but um, because it's those kind of plant fibers and strings, those strings would break off and kind of shear and pull all those gametophytes off with them. The wool had the same thing. Those fibers would slowly fray off and take all of the spores or gametophytes or baby kelps with them. I was so hopeful at first for both of those. Uh, of the ones that did actually have good uh, yield on them, the cotton cords are just like your gardening twine did really, really well. And it had surprisingly high break strength after being in water for almost seven months, up to 16 kilos to break that. I basically had it pulling down on a scale and was reading the numbers until it snapped. It's an interesting thing to have some string left over versus none at all, because it could be okay, or it could mean it'd be horrible for the farmers. My goal was to have no fiber left at all, but still have kelp so that while they were harvesting, they didn't have to risk or worry about any of that natural fiber or string sections going into the harvest or going into their final product. But if there is string, they can still potentially harvest, leave the string on the line, go throw it in your yard and set it and forget it for six months until the winter comes back. And maybe by then it will be completely dissolved or you can by hand just rip it off the rope. You don't need to worry about cutting or getting entangled or ripping it off. So if there was an entanglement, you could just by hand pull it apart. But for us, the clear winner of all of that for me was the silk because we had good yield and there was no fiber left at all. It completely melted away. So for me, out of this project, silk was the clear winner. Another reason I was really excited about the silk 
is that it's such a fine, thin fiber. I can fit two and a half times the length of fiber to a single pipe as I can with that hold fast, which, you know, okay, 2.5 doesn't sound like a whole lot, but think about a five inch pipe versus a 15 inch pipe. I can fit a lot of string on a 15 inch pipe with that silk. The growth rate for the natural fibers as well is quite interesting. The wool and the sides would look like they were just going gangbusters, but I think that was because the density was so low as those other plants went away, they had less competition around them. So what's next? Um, this is actually the second year I'd been running this experiment. The first year, all of my cotton fibers dissolved within the first month, so that didn't work. But I had fertilizer results from that year too. I haven't really um, married the two years together or compared them yet. I want to publish this um, research this winter. That's my goal for this, this winter season when I'm not running a hatchery, which sounds like might not be very much time, but I'm going to do my best to get both things done. We're also very excited because we got funded this year, this winter, to run a commercial hatchery for the University of Alaska Fairbanks to produce seed, commercial seed for farmers that we're going to basically copy paste this experiment at commercial scale. So right now, instead of doing a one meter or a three foot section of string, I'm doing hundred foot sections of string and we're doing it with bulk kelp. So commercial scale, replicating it with sugar kelp at scale as well as a new species at scale. So I'm really, really excited. We're paired with uh, Sequester Farms here in Juneau, and we're also doing some commercial production for some other farmers across the state. I have so many people I need to thank for this project. First and foremost is Muriel Dietrich, pictured here with me and my dog. Um, she's running her own master's project on red seaweeds, how to grow palmaria or dulse in tumble cultures. But last year I convinced her, hey, there's this algae prize competition and I need a buddy. Would you want to come do this project with me? It was basically my thesis project, just with a few modifications. Um, Chum turned into doing that or roped her, if you would. And she was such an amazing asset to keep me in good humor. Another pair of hands to split the labor with. Uh, we had some pretty trying times together, but it all panned out because we were the grand champion winners of the first ever algae prize and walked away with twenty thousand uh, dollars cash. That was an amazing experience. I have Muriel to thank for that, as well as Dr. Steckel, as well as all the other faculty and administration people at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, Dr. Steckel's been amazingly patient with me. He's kind of been my uh, kind of guiding, steering touchstone of an individual since I started working in kelp with him back in 2015. And the farmers I've been working with off and on throughout the years, we had some incredible fast friends, um, all of the amazing people we've gotten to interact with in the industry, and they're really what make this industry work. So I'm just so happy and honored that I'm able to hopefully help them with this project to move the industry forward, make their lives easier, and get them more money. <laughs> so with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen if anyone has any questions. Um, all right, I have a question. Yeah. How cost-wise, how does the silk compare to the industry standard string? Is it cheaper? You know, it's it's not that much more expensive. I thought it was going to be way more expensive because you think silk, you think luxury items and goods, but I can go onto a beading outlet store and get a couple hundred yards of the stuff for about the same price as a couple hundred yards of the hold fast. And I was thinking, you know, the couple hundred yards of the hold fast comes in these big bales, almost like a um, big yarn, but the, the couple hundred yards of the silk was a little almost thimble. So it's pretty cool. I need to, that's part of the publication I'm going to do is some economic analysis as well, because there's a potential that some of the fibers in comparison with their yield still might be cheaper because I can fit so much more on a single pipe. So therefore reducing the number of tanks, reducing the volume of fertilizer I even need to order or work with. Oh. So yay, I get to do a whole bunch of math this, and economics this fall and winter, which is not my strong suit, but that's what I have friends and family for. Cool. Thank you. That was an awesome presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's it's really cool. It, it you know it's kind of felt like throwing wet noodles at the wall to see what stuck, but 
it ended up working out okay. <laughs> so now it's cool to, I'm really excited to be able to do it now at commercial scale. I'm really, really excited to get that stuff in the water. Yeah, you'll have to keep us appraised. Oh, one more question. What are you doing, or what are the kelp farmers that you work with doing for like preserving and selling their product? Are they like, you know trying to dry? I have no idea, honestly. I've kind of been out of touch with the commercial side of things, and there's a lot of um, proprietary stuff going on. I know that there's a lot of interest in drying. I'm not sure who's doing what in terms of this year. I feel like every year there's new technology or someone's trying something else on, on at scale. Um, but since I've kind of gotten out of, this is about, this is the first time I've been back in the commercial sector for a couple of years. I've kind of been fringe and just, you know, through hearsay, but I think the vast majority are still freezing. Great, you'll have to keep us surprised of all of your future research. Yeah, no, and I'd love for you to come back and visit soon. And if, and if you have any questions or if anyone comes to you with questions, feel free to send them on my way. I'm always happy to chat. Great. Thanks, Tamsin. Yeah, thank you guys. Have a great evening. You too. Bye.